Welcome to Chapter 1, History and Current Issues in Forensic Psychology. <clears throat> in 1256, English judge Henry de Bracton formulated what he called the wild beast test. He basically used this as a way to identify insane people that he believed should not be held morally accountable for their actions because they were quote-unquote beast-like. And so for centuries, we considered it unjust to label someone a criminal unless that unlawful act they committed was performed with a guilty mind. Now, in the criminal justice system, we refer to that as mens rea, or criminal intent. In 1915, in People v. People v. Schmidt, Hans Schmidt was charged with killing and dismembering a woman and then throwing her remains into the Hudson River. Now, he claimed God had commanded the killing as a sacrifice and atonement. And so he pled guilty um, in court. <clears throat> he, sorry, he pled insanity in court. Now, Judge Cardozo was the judge at the time, and he later on goes on to be a Supreme Court justice. And he said that if a person has an insane delusion, they cannot be said to know what they were doing was wrong. In Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in 1954, um, this is the first time that we're using psychological research um, in a SCOTUS, a SCOTUS decision. SCOTUS stands for Supreme Court of the United States. Now, if you recall, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas is where separate but equal education was struck down. And so this signals a dramatic change in the role of scientific and psychological evidence, um, both in advocacy and the decision making performed by judges. In 1961, research conducted by um, Bandera was used by lawmakers, and this research showed that aggressive behavior seen on TV and in the movies can be transmitted to children via imitation if that aggression is seen as being rewarded. And so this is social learning research. And then your book goes on to talk about a series of cases in which um, psychological evidence was used. And just to highlight two of those, in 1985, Dan White killed Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone in San Francisco, and he argued that junk food made him do it. Um, and this was come to be known as the Twinkie defense. It's the only time it's actually been successfully argued in court and in reality, probably what was happening here was um, Harvey Milk was gay. And so it's probably much more likely that gay panic is the reason that these, um, you know, jurors voted the way they did. In 2002, there was a series of um, spree murders in D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. And they were committed by a stepfather and his stepson. Now, Malvo was 17 at the time, and he's the stepson, and he argued he was being controlled by his stepfather, Muhammad. So forensic psychology and forensic science, this, um, these words often get misused. Forensic just means related to the courts. So when we put forensic in front of any other discipline, pathology, anthropology, dentistry, accounting, we're just talking about how that discipline is used in the legal system. We can also see how psychology is used in civil law, criminal law, juries, um, policing, assessment, uh, as it rel relates to ethics and social issues. So looking at some issues in forensic psychology, it's good to start by thinking about the fact that forensic psychology and psychiatry deal with legal aspects of human behavior. And so it's the application of psychological principles and knowledge to legal activities. And that could include everything from a child custody to a case involving child abuse, um, assessing someone's capacity to manage their own affairs, so do they need a guardian, uh, competency to stand trial, whether or not they're criminally responsible, and also advising judges in terms of sentencing. Now, expert testimony can be applied in general, how a typical rape victim may react, or more specifically, whether a rape occurred in a specific case. Um, forensic psychologists might also testify about syndromes or profiles, so that could include battered women syndrome and rape trauma syndrome, or the profile of a battering parent or a child sexual abuser. Now it's important to keep in mind that legal reasoning is largely deductive, while scientific uh, reasoning is inductive. And legal findings are based on certainties and standards, like the burden of proof being beyond a reasonable doubt, while scientific findings are based on probabilities and contingencies. 
Now, in 1895, James McKean Cattle conducted one of the earliest studies of forensic psychology, and he was testing the reliability of witness testimony. And he was surprised to find how inaccurate um, his subjects' reports of their memory were, especially because they were very confident in their responses. Now, since then, this is research that's been supported repeatedly, in particular by Benet and Stern. Stern found that emotions decrease the accuracy of witness recall, but today we know that um, despite the fact that many people think an eyewitness is perhaps like the best evidence you can have against somebody, eyewitness testimony is highly faulty. In 1896, we see the first time forensic psychology is taken into the court system. And this happens at a murder trial in Munich. Now, <clears throat> the researcher here was drawing on research into errors of recall and suggestibility and argued that pretrial publicity resulted in witnesses not being able to distinguish between what they actually saw and what they read in the press. And they called this perceptual error retroactive memory falsification. In 1911, it was first used in a civil trial where they looked at someone's reaction time. Um, an engineer had, um, had an accident, a train engineer, and they showed that the engineer could not have stopped the train in time. Now, in 1908, Hugo Munsterberg, who is considered the father of modern forensic psychology, advocated for increased use of psychology in courts and legal systems. He describes in his book some factors that can affect a trial's outcome, things like false confessions, the power of suggestion and cross-examination, and the use of psychological me measurements <coughs> to detect heightened emotional states in suspects and defendants. So this is essentially um, arguing for what eventually becomes the use of um, polygraphs. So a polygraph doesn't actually measure whether you're lying, it measures your heart rate, your blood pressure, and sometimes your skin conductivity. He also recommended that witnesses be tested for reliability in experimental situations before their testimony is accepted. Now in 1922, William Markson becomes the first American professor of legal psychology and he creates the first systolic blood pressure test that's used to detect deception. Again, the forerunner of um, the polygraph. And this was rejected in court because it was not practical. And today we don't use them in court for a different reason. It's because it hasn't met um, general uh, acceptability within the scientific community. And by the 1950s, psychologists began testifying successfully in courts in America. Now, it's important to come back to this Brown versus Board of Education case. Now, in this case, two of the plaintiff psychologists, uh, they were a married couple, the Clarks, they designed a test that was called the Doll Test to study the psychological effects of segregation on black children. They used four diaper-clad cloth dolls that were ex identical except for their color. And the majority chose the white doll as the one they preferred and the one to which they attributed the most positive characteristics. They also gave them outline drawings of a boy and girl and asked them to color them the same color as themselves. And many children with dark complexion still colored the figure white or yellow. So the researchers here concluded that prejudice, discrimination, and segregation cause black children to develop a sense of inferiority and self-hatred. Now this is really important because Brown versus the Board of Education overturned um, Plessy v. Ferguson, which said that separate but equal was fine. And so this is a serious blow to Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws are codified separation of the races. Um, basically, you know, once we have freed the slaves, Jim Crow laws are, thing, are, are laws like poll taxes. Um, they're basically laws that limit the freedom and opinions of former slaves in the South following the Civil War. So what are some ways that forensic psychology has made an impact? So um, forensic psychologists have provided expert testimony on how dangerous someone might be, uh, criminal responsibility, child custody, psychological damage, malingering and deception, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and eyewitness testimony. They've also filed amicus briefs in court, and amicus brief is uh, amicus refers to friend, it's a friend of the court, and they have filed briefs on affirmative action, child abuse, civil commitment, competency, insanity, the death penalty, duty to warn, that should say gay parenting, the right to refuse medication, and sexual harassment. 
Um, and so one last thing before we finish up here. In the 1960s, psychologist Bruno Bettelheim said, autistic children were produced by quote-unquote refrigerator moms. Um, these are moms that are not competent to bond emotionally with their children, and it resulted in a complete incapacity for emotional attachment in their children. And this had a significant impact on how society viewed childcare. 